Good afternoon, one and all. Oh, James here. Great to see you. I've got to try and remember to look straight at the camera. Uh, great to see you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. We think the session is going to be lasting for you guys in the region of one hour to one hour, 15 minutes. It actually has to be finished in 90 minutes. I'm doing that Excel in a bit at five o'clock, so I've got to be ready for that. So we will be done by then. Um, a couple of things about today, first of all, folks. I would be so grateful if you could hit us a subscribe and or a like on the YouTube channel if you're there. That would be fantastic. If you are on the hub page, you should be able to do that as well from there. Um, we really appreciate it. It's a small thing. We don't really send much stuff out to be fair that way. And it just gives our channel a little bit of a boost and more people see it basically, which is great. So that's that. Um, secondly, I will introduce you to Marta in a moment. She's going to be my little helper for the day, but she just wandered off at the worst possible moment. So I'll introduce her when she gets back. Um, thirdly, Comments and questions today, folks. We love a bit of interaction. So do send in your comments. Do send in your questions. We do actually do shout outs at the end of the show. If anybody really wants to get mentioned, I'm not sure how cool it is to get me mentioning you online. But anyway, whatever. Um, but we will do a shout out or two. And let us know if you're in the, you know, you're on a classroom with a teacher, what you do and how it's working, eating pizza, whatever, whatever. Um, but you can do that via the hub page. And we've got uh, uh, a live chat in there. And Marta's manning that for us. So do come into that. And Marta, I just said to say hello to you but you'd wandered off yeah wandered off yes. she's back, back. Martha's going to be fielding questions you can also contact us on any of our social channels we will pick those up we did have to turn off the YouTube live chat we found out that educational environments and YouTube live chats don't always work particularly well in, in combination perhaps most importantly resources if you're on the hub page just down there you'll see there's notes pages there's mock exam there's mark scheme there's model answers etc go infographic is there on that page as well i think just above so go and get hold of that stuff as a minimum for the session you'll have those notes pages you really need those the others are kind of back up you'll see as i go into the session now and there we go so folks we have a lot to cover you've probably seen from the notes packs like this right we have a lot to cover and we are going to fly through this there's going to be no break in the middle we're going to go for i would estimate around about an hour and i'll come back towards the end onto the camera and we'll do some questions that any of you have got do post your questions especially if they're kind of subject based and i'll do my utmost to be able to answer them for you and we love a bit we love to hear from you so that would be great if you're able to do that so marta unless you tell me otherwise no, I'm, not telling you otherwise. I'm going to switch feeds and go straight to the canvas and see if i can do a job for you here folks and get some good information for you. Bear with me, folks. This is always the nerve-wracking bit. Here we go. Okay, one of the things I'm really determined to get across to you guys this afternoon is content and skills. But before we do that, let's just make sure you've got what you need in front of you. Obviously, you're taking this session, you're hearing this. You need to have your notes page in front of you. If you haven't got them, get down into the description of the YouTube video, onto the hub page, they're there, that your teacher may have given them to you. Ideally, have your exam for graphics. I'm going to touch on that. This is sort of a breakdown of what the AQA GCP Paper 1 requires of you. You should have the national mock exam exam paper perhaps you've completed perhaps you haven't it doesn't matter but you want that available to you because i'm going to touch on that as well you want the mark scheme for that and which we've just published published you want the model answers i'm going to refer to those here as well so those are the things you should have with you now before we get into sort of the nitty-gritty of this i want you to pe pay attention to our what are they six or eight six um, performer profiles whenever you have to give an example consider using option one two three as k these are people you don't necessarily need to name them but for example you could be talking about an elite level sprinter uh, a novice tennis player you could use these individuals as examples or at least in your revision and preparation be start to think okay i've learned this relationship to a volleyball player or a high intensity performer how does it relate to someone like a triathlete for example so those profiles are there as I guess ammunition for you and fodder for you so that you can further apply to different circumstances now with all that said let's actually get into this what are we going to cover in this session now what you're seeing on the screen here folks it that stuff there let me just try and get it on the screen properly that stuff there is everything that I covered in the national mock exam. So if you go and find the national mock exam, every one of those topics is there. There's a question, of course, then the marks and the model answers will give you that sort of the insight into that specific circumstance. But what you're seeing kind of here highlighted in the sort of minty green, fresh looking thing, these are the topics which in this session I am going to cover. So yes, folks, I am, however many ticks there are, 12 or something, 
I'm going to attempt to cover all of these in this, whatever it is, hour, hour and 20 session we're going to do now. And can I stress to you folks, you may need to take this session multiple times because I am not going to make any apologies for the fact that I'm going to go at a right pace because you guys can watch this more than once. You can pause it, you can rewind it, you can make notes. Obviously, if you're live, you're live, but you know it's there for you after as well. So I make no apologies. I'm going to try and squeeze as much as I humanly can into this opportunity to give you guys the best platform for going forward. Now, I mentioned something a moment ago. We're going to obviously move on to the functions of the skeleton immediately, right? But I mentioned to you skills and content. I want to prove that to you. If you look at this image, which I'm going to get rid of in a second, if you look at this image, this is how AQA have asked students about function of the skeleton traditionally. First of all, first of all, let me put a, a layer on there. First of all, they tend to ask it, right? That's great. So we can see here they tend to ask questions. Not every year. One year they didn't. But the other thing here, folks, if you notice, they ask us to name the functions. We'll touch on that. But crucially, they ask us to apply them to the impact and performance. That's what AO2 is. So we want to do more than just naming things. So what I'm going to do here is get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of that. And we are now going to make an actual uh, effort on this. For, forgive me for having that red line there. So what are we going to do? We are going to go through our function. Now, our AO1 material is simply naming this stuff. You can talk about support, movement, protection of vital organs, five flat bones, structural shape and points of attachment. That will get you... If you name them in context, that will get you those AO1 credits. But what we want to be able to do is apply them. Now, look at this wording up here, folks. I'm saying to you as AQA GCSE students, you must be able to talk about the impact of these functions on different performers. Now, I'm going to fill these in with a range of performers. You could complete this specific to, for example, the six performers above, right? So what are we going to do? I'm going to come back to support, and I'll show you why in a second. First of all, I'm going to go straight into protection of vital organs by flat bones, flat bones look at this one the cranium protects the brain during a rugby tackle we could take that further and say so that there is not a concussion so i'm going to say so that there is no concussion i could put into my answer do you see there's the impact of that now with that in mind let's do this one here something protect the lungs when uh, at, when <laughs> being struck in a something bout so of course this is the ribs protect the lungs when being struck in a boxing bout. We could say falling from a BMX bike or equivalent. Um, sternum protects the heart during a fall from the high bar in gymnastics. I'll just put gym there for sure, okay? The point we want to get across is we're doing more than simply naming. Also notice, I'm not gonna get a mark simply by saying the cranium protects the brain. I need to say when and what impact it has. Okay, let's take it further. Something protect the spinal cord during a crash in motorsport. Well, of course, that is the vertebrae, which I haven't actually left myself uh, enough space for, but the vertebrae protect. And so on. now, if I come back to my support one here, support such as the lower body when landing from a hmm or the head when hmm. Now, if I fill this in, I'm simply going to say that this, this is going to be landing. Uh, this is simply going to be landing from a jump or what the head when twisting so my body my frame my skeleton it provides that support but if we need to take it into impact where do we take this such as the body when landing from a jump let's go for in basketball so that we don't fall okay now that is now impact as well as just stating what it is. So guys, I'm asking you in there to Im implement impact. Movement is all about leverage, get that in. And I've got here, I'm linking it literally to levers. Leverage such as the ankle acting as a second class lever during plant deflection, providing mechanical advantage when jumping for a rebound. Structural shape and points of attachment. Muscles contract via tendons onto bones, such as, and obviously you could choose almost anything here, such, um, such as the bicep, tendon pulling on the radius to cause elbow flexion. Can there be anything more specific than I've written? Another one here, posture, including sporting posture, upright posture, running posture, curve of the spine. So there's sort of human postural shapes. Mineral storage, we've got here, calcium for bone strength, allowing, <coughs> allowing for more forceful contractions against the bones during, let's say, running. Okay, so the bones can resist more. Phosphorus, we have here, for ongoing muscle contraction, 
because that's what it helps with during an Olympic rowing event. Okay, so I'm just choosing my uh, answers here, but I'm making sure I've got impact. Iron for something, I'm going to name it as hemoglobin, HB, which then transports oxygen, or you could say red blood cells, transports oxygen to be utilized in aerobic respiration. Can you guys clearly see that this is stating what the impact of these functions are? Let's take it further. We've got here blood cell production in the bone marrow of long and flat bones. That's where this happens. Red blood cells for oxygen and CO2 transport, oh, sorry, red blood cells for oxygen and CO2 transport, making aerobic respiration more efficient during a, let's go for a triathlon. There's our character, Kate, for example. And we could be thinking about Kate when we're answering that. White blood cells for immunity, keeping performance healthy and training regularly. And finally, platelets for clotting when the skin is broken during a fall from a BMX bike race. So folks, we clearly, in all of those examples, even the ones we're adding in, talking about impact. Why? Because we want the capacity where necessary to get that work there, the AO2, the actual application of this. Okay, let's move on to topic two, folks. Antagonistic muscle pairs. One of the areas which if you're able to nail this, will give you a really great uh, it'll give you a great advantage because it's very commonly required. So a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to name pairs of muscles. Pair one. What do we have here? A muscle A is a tricep. Don't forget your S on the end. And muscle B is a bicep. Those two muscles work in combination, work together. And of course, this is to cause and allow movement at the elbow. Okay, so that's what those muscles are for. We could go further. B here, we have got the gluteals. We're going to come back to this in a second, but the gluteals, when flexing, when, um, when contracting, they will cause uh, extension at the hip. But we've also, on the front, got the hip flexors. Don't forget the E on the end of this, because this is multiple muscles. They're called the psoas and the iliacus, but we don't study that at this level. We've got other combinations here. A is the quadricep. Do not write quads, please, folks. You are going to write quadricep with the S on the end. And its partner are the hamstrings. And finally, we have got our gastrocnemius, everyone's favorite spelling. And we also have our tibialis anterior. Interesting little spelling all by itself. So first things first, folks, those are the pairs of muscles we want you guys to have an awareness of. And I should stress, of course, this is for action at the knee. This is for action at the ankle. And up here, of course, because we're involved in hip flexors and gluteals, this is for movement at the hip. We're going to come back to certain analysis of movement in a few moments' time. But before we get into that, I just want to remind you of a couple of terms. Term one is the following term. I would like you to recall what prime mover refers to, because we're going to touch on that in a lot of detail in a few moments' time. So this is the muscle that is contracting when moving. Now, notice... I am not talking about shortening or lengthening. It can actually both, but it's, contr it's contracting when moving, okay? So if we are moving some kind of sporting action, the prime mover is that which is contracting. Please don't say causing movement. Please don't say shortening. It's contracting. And of course, there's different types of contraction. We're gonna come back to that. Secondly, we, and by the way, the other name of a prime mover is an agonist. And that's useful because now we are gonna talk about antagonists and remind yourself that an antagonist very clearly very specifically folks is the muscle which is relaxing not lengthening relaxing to allow movement okay so i really want you to get that idea clear in your mind it's not just that we're going to use it it's that you need to understand it the prime mover critically is contracting. The antagonist, the agonist is contracting. The antagonist is relaxing. There are no variations, folks. If the muscle is contracting, it is a prime mover. If the muscle is react, uh, relaxing, it is an antagonist. No exceptions. That is that. Now, that becomes really important when we start to look at types of contractions, folks. Now, we can go back to the examples we've got above of our sort of our paired images and that stuff, but I'm actually going to take this further with um, some basic movement analysis. So, let's remind ourselves. We have got one type of, let me do that darker, we have got one type of contraction, we have got two types of contraction. So folks, first things first, our contractions are either isometric, isotonic, there is a third one, we're not, we don't do it at this level, but isometric and isotonic. So I want to 
sort of clarify and distill what the differences are. An isometric muscle contraction, remember, not a contraction of anything else, muscle tissue contraction, that occurs when the muscle does not change length, okay? Equal length, literally is the definition of the word isometric. The muscle does not change length. So think about, for example, a downhill skier, skier in that squat position, holding the tuck. Think about a gymnast in balance. Think about a badminton player in ready position, waiting to receive the serve. These are all isometric contractions, and we're getting moments of stillness, okay? Secondly, we have got our isotonic. Isotonic simply means the muscle is moving, and it can move in one or two ways. It can either shorten, called a concentric, or it can lengthen, called an eccentric. In both cases, whether it's this or this, the muscle which is performing isotonically and isometrically is the prime mover. So I want to be clear here, folks. Antagonists never do this. Okay, Only agonists, prime movers. And we're going to come to that in a bit of detail. In fact, I'm going to write that down for you. Um, antagonists, antagonists never, and we'll put, we'll put contract in big writing. So we could say they never isometric, they never isotonic. They do neither, folks. They can't. Why? Because if we go back to what we said before, what are they doing? Relaxing. That's the only thing an antagonist does. Hence, it never contracts. So I'm just going to take the briefest pause to sip my drink, and we're going to come straight back in terms of applying this to movement now in movement analysis. So let's get right stuck into this. We're going to start applying that knowledge immediately. It's really quite likely that we're going to be asked about analysis of movement in our exams, folks. We don't know for sure, but obviously it's, it's, it's a really great investment of your time to truly understand this. So that's my ambition here. Okay, so let's look. And by the way, I should stress as well, that what we call analysis of movement, including movement of so, so synovial joints, folks, these movements I want to go through now, the football throw in, the press up, the basic squat, the vertical, these, the running, these are actually named by AQN specification. Now, AQA can go beyond this. For example, you'll notice that we took the basic squat in the national work exam and linked it to a deadlift because effectively it's the same technique weighted, of course. But these are the ones that if you've got the foundation of these, you're going to be very, very confident. So let's just look at something first of all. When we are talking about a, um, a press up, you'll typically get two images from your examiner, okay? And the image is going to be sort of like phase A or stage A and phase B, right? So what have we got here? We need to be able to know what is happening at the elbow in both the upward and the downward phase. So of course, the, down, the, the upward phase is from B to A. And the downward phase is from A to B. That's what we're talking about, right? Okay, so let's look at the upward phase first of all. We are saying the tricep, which of course, remind yourself, is this muscle on the back of the arm, which inserts onto the point of the elbow just here. And of course, what happens here is this person pushes up. What this is going to do is it's going to shorten. That makes it a con isotonic concentric contraction. Of course, pushes up into phase A. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This same muscle, folks inserting there on the elbow, if, well, let's put its origin in as well up there. Um, this same muscle, if we now lower ourselves to the ground from phase A to phase B, the tricep remains the prime mover. Why? Because it is still under tension, so there's still tension under that muscle, okay? And that muscle is lengthening to effectively allow that movement to happen down towards the ground. It's, it's acting effectively as a break, okay? So it's B-R-A-K-E. It's, it's allowing us down to the ground. Now, if, would you be surprised, even though it's elbow flexion, if I told you that the antagonist here, the antagonist, what is it? It's the bicep. So even though this is elbow flexion, what's the bicep doing? We know what an antagonist is. It is ca absolutely categorically relaxing. Okay, that's what that is. Let's look, move to a different example. Elbow throwing, much simpler in many ways here. We're looking, we're interested in the same muscle, which is the tricep here. Let me do it in a darker red. Tricep here, same insertion onto the elbow. Now what's going to happen here is this tricep is on the throw is gonna is gonna pull downwards, straighten the arm to here, and the ball, of course, is going to release and go off that way. Now that is what we call the release in that sense. The tricep is pulling concentrically to push the ball forward. Now, as we go in the opposite direction, the first phase of this to bring the ball back, imagine just preparing to do a throw in. Of course, this is the bicep causing elbow flexion, and it's doing that through a shortening action. So important to be able to distinguish between those two movements. Now, I'm not. I'm going to go over this one in a little bit of detail for you. Okay. So first things first things first. Let's make sure. Let's make sure that we're really happy with what we're talking about here. 
When we talk about drive and recovery, we are talking about the two phases. Now this leg here is currently in drive phase and this leg here is currently sort of coming back through and is in the recovery phase. Let me just change color. So this here is the recovery of the leg coming back through. Here, of course, the leg is pushing down. So let's look at the hip in the action that we've got here. I'm interested to begin with, I'm in the drive leg, so this is this leg at the back here. So we've got an isotonic concentric contraction. We've got hip flexion, so that has to be done what by the gluteals, okay, particularly the gluteus maximus, but the gluteals. The recovery, of course, is through the hip flexor, which is pulling us through here. And of course, again, that is a, I'm going to call it an isotonic, well, I'm going to call it, it is an isotonic concentric contraction. Now look at the knee in the same uh, movements, okay? The knee now, when we're in the drive phase, this back this back leg, we've got the knee which is going into extension. So of course, if it's extension, it has to be the quadricep which is contracting concentrically. And the recovery, we've effectively got a, a flex knee, a bent knee. So of course, what causes this is the hamstrings. Okay, so these are our prime mover. The opposite would be the case for um, for the antagonist of Kate, of course. And finally, with the ankle, it gets a little bit interesting in this one, but here in the dry face, can you see how the gastrocnemius here is pulling on the heel and it's pointing the toes? We call that plantar flexion, that's the gastrocnemius. But here on the drive leg, the toe is kind of up a little bit here, isn't it? We would call that dorsiflexion, flexion, but this is actually done by the tibialis anterior. Now I've written that in too light a color. If you can't see that, that means your projector bulb if you're in the classroom isn't very good. And that is also an isotonic concentric attraction. Now, if you're unsure about those folks, please review it, please discuss it with your teacher and make sure you're confident with those things. I'm gonna go further here. In many ways, a similar sort of model. I'm not gonna go through the whole of these, but I just wanna sort of, I just wanna highlight something for you here. All the contractions here are concentric. And what we're saying here is that in, you know, you notice here, obviously, we've got the, the phase being the preparation kick. The, the preparation is when the leg is back like that. The kick is when uh, the leg is forward like this. But can I stress to you one thing? At the ankle, you could argue that the main muscle working at the ar at the ankle is actually the gastrocnemius in the kicking action because the toes remain pointed. A really good, for example, football striking technique would do that. But what we see here with Johnny Sexton is his toes have kind of literally curled back in that direction. And we would call that a concentric contraction of the tibialis anterior. So just make sure you can differentiate those things. Okay, last one, I think, before we change canvases. We here have a vertical jump, okay? So we've got a performer, we've got a phase A, we've got a phase B again. That's what you're typically gonna receive in your exam questions. What have we got? Well, first of all, we're looking at the two phases. This here, phase B is our takeoff, phase A is our landing, right? So let's look at takeoff first of all. Our gluteals, what they're doing is that they are, of course, pulling the leg back, effectively the leg is coming back here, straightening at the hip. That is a form of extension of the hip, and of course the gluteals are doing that concentrically. But when we land, notice what's happening. This muscle now here, the gluteal, is working as a brake and working eccentrically because it's slowing our action down towards the ground. Very similar model you now get for the knee. Notice the quadricep is powering us upwards in the takeoff, but when we land here, it's acting here as a brake. Oh, sorry, wrong area. Here, it's acting as a brake. It means that we're landing and it's slowing our descent down. And what do we get at the ankle? Exactly the same. The gastrocnemius drives us upwards. And of course, as we land, the gastrocnemius acts as a brake and works eccentrically. So a really good example of where we can uh, take our understanding. Now, I need to change the canvas. One moment, I'll be straight back. Well, I've just been delivered a magnificent cup of tea. Well... When does life get better than that? When you're in the middle of a revision session, you're feeling thirsty. Anyway, let's get on with this. I would normally at this point go into what we call the basic squat analysis, okay? So this is one of the named uh, movement analysis possibilities for it. Now, what you've seen we've done in our national mock exam is we took our basic squat and we said, okay, it doesn't say specifically with AQA, you can only analyze those moves. So we're just gonna tweak and adjust it to be a deadlift. So we thought that might be a little bit more challenging for you. So let's actually run through the questions. If this was a basic squat, in this case, a deadlift. So. This image shows performance of a deadlift. We agree. Identify the movement pattern occurring at the knee in position A. So I'm going to very quickly say, look, we're only interested in position A here. And I'm looking for the knee position. And I can draw over the knee position there. So we know because that is effectively a reduced joint angle, because we can see there 
that effectively the knee is bent, we know that that is an example of flexion, or in this case, knee flexion. So there's where our marks are come from. And what your examiner would do is if they were doing it on paper, which they won't be, but they would do it like this, they would tick you and they'd put you a mark over there, okay? So that's what they're gonna do with your answer all being well. But in question nine, we've got to do a little bit more. It says, identify both the agonist and ag antagonist at the knee when the performer moves from position A to position B. So we are in the downward movement we're going from flexion to extension, okay? So we're going from A to B. Let me just check I've got that right around. Yep, from A to B, we've got flexion to extension. So first of all, our agonist, let me change color, our agonist for this movement, when we're talking about extension, we are gonna say that is the quadricep group, okay? So that is the quadricep group. We're also gonna say that the antagonist, and I'll prove this to you in a second, the antagonist is the hamstring group. Okay, or we'll call it here the hamstrings. So this is what we should be answering in questions like this, nice and simple, nice and clear. Now let me just sort of prove that to you. What's happening here is effectively as this person straightens and stands up, what's happening here is that we are going from a flex position at the knee to an extended position at the knee. And of course the muscle that powers that movement is the quadricep that is shortening and contracting it's pulling actually on the front of the tibia to straighten the knee to extend the knee therefore that's our agonist our antagonist is the hamstrings now we've got to go a bit further here to identify the type of muscle contraction so this is type of contraction occurring in the agonist of the knee we're moving from a to b so we're now flipping it okay we're flipping it and we're saying okay from a to b which of course if we go back uh, sorry from a to b so we've now, I thought we were flipping it, we're not, we're doing, uh, we're doing the same, we're on the way down. So we're saying what type of contraction is this? So we've got from A to B, so we've got the straightening action. Well, of course, this is the quadricep shortening under tension. So this is what we would call, change color again, James. This is what we would call an isotonic concentric contraction. Why? Because that, and by the way, I must say why, because, the muscle is shortening under tension. Okay, so there we go. There's our answer in this case. Okay, so we've got isotonic concentric because the muscle is shortening under tension. Again, your examiner will come along and they go, there is your correct mark and there is your correct mark. That's what they would do. And they'll probably reference over here that that's point one and that's point two in the mark scheme. Okay, check our actual mark scheme and our model answers for full understanding of that. Now, to finish this off, folks, we're gonna have a quick look at shoulder action in cricket bowling. Now, the key principle I wanna get across here is that what's happening with this arm, and we've used this before, we won't go into details of our player here, but we've used this before because their arm comes very straight from here to here to here, where it is now here to here to here to here to here. Now, if we were to sort of do that kind of circle there we've got the arm rotating clockwise and that clockwise rotation that full rotation we've got to be careful with, with the word rotation because it is actually a different movement pattern but what we're saying here is that that shoulder powered in this case by the deltoid is moving through a combination of flexion extension abduction adduction and this results in what we call circumduction so if the circ prefix you know the circling helps you by all means use that but the point we want to make here is that this is a full arm circle and it's a combination of these movements to produce that circumduction okay now in this movement it's all isotonic concentric and it's been done by the delta there's actually a number of muscles contributing here but look out for that one in your exam and don't be afraid to use the language of circumduction should that be relevant in that particular question okay let's move things on we've got blood vessels here so section four we're making great progress some big sections done already so a couple of things i want to stress here we need to make sure that we can do two things with blood blood vessels we must know their structure we must know their function okay so both are relevant and you should be looking out for questions that ask you specifically for structure and specifically for function so what i'm going to do for our three blood vessels i'm going to do structure in green and i'll over here I'll put something like function in red, okay? Now, if you think about what structure and function actually means, structure means what it's like, what its characteristics are, function means what it does. So, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna first of all talk about an artery structure. So, a couple of things first of all, let's get straight into this. It's got a smooth muscle layer, that's what it's like, smooth muscle layer. 
and you can see that on the image of course secondly we've also got the idea here that it has a smaller lumen I'll prove this to you a smaller lumen and this is compared to veins by the way so if we go back to our artery our lumen here which is the diameter the opening of the vessel if we were to compare that for example to here this one's much greater right so we've got a smaller lumen compared uh, to a vein and that's uh, well, I'm going to regions when we get to functions why that would be the case and finally we've got elastic walls okay now the reason that is relevant is we'll come back to functions in a second is arteries deal with high pressure blood so therefore they need to be kind of elastic in their property now if we take I'll just do a slightly different shade here if we take this and that's not a different shade is it if we take this into veins okay with veins what we're saying here is we can say they've got a thin muscle wall so they have muscle around them but it's thinner now we'll come back to that they actually pulse those muscles to force blood back uh, secondly they have a large lumen no surprise there large lumen and finally folks they have pocket valves now the pocket valves are not depicted I'll just quickly draw you a very what ruish depiction I'm sure but if we've got imagine this is a vein here and the blood is going up and returning to the heart the heart's over here somewhere you know so <laughs> not to scale folks so what we're saying is that as blood comes up here we have valves that sit in our veins like this and when the blood pushes up it opens these valves but when uh, the, the heart goes through diastole remember that relaxation phase and the blood sort of drops back via gravity this valve will close okay that's effectively what's happening there now finally folks we have got we have got of course our capillaries so the the now structure of our capillaries is, is as follows folks we've got they are one cell thick okay new biologists you'll know that they're endothelial cells we're not going to talk about that here but they're one cell thick they surround tissues in a capillary bed that's what they do that's where we're, they're found um we can also say they're between they're between arteries and veins and finally folks they are very numerous very huge hundreds of thousands of them per tissue okay in fact millions in fact but the point I really wanted to make is to actually link this to your biology. Now, I know we don't touch on this exactly in PE, but I'm going to sort of just try and represent it. If we were to find a red blood cell, folks, and I'm going to sort of draw it as a kind of a, a, a disc shape here, a red blood cell would fit and as its kind of biconcave shape. Red blood cell fits exactly through that space of that capillary. So that capillary is tiny. Now, we're not going to get into the seven micrometers of blood of, um, of RBC, of red blood cells. You know that from biology. But the point I want to make is that this is now perfectly suited for its role that we're going to come up to in a second, its function. So what we will now do is talk about the functions of these different vessels. So arteries first, folks. We have got here that they carry oxygenated blood Okay, now I'm hoping someone's saying, James, that's not always true. But of course, there is the exception, which is our pulmonary artery, which is carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs, of course, so look out for that one. Secondly, we mentioned they deal with high pressure blood. Think about the blood being ejected from the heart during cardiac, during ventricular systole, and that blood is being forced out at really, really high pressure. Um, furthermore, they can constrict they can constrict and dilate okay so they can constrict and dilate and all we mean by that is that they can open and close lesser and more and of course that's used for the redistribution of blood now let's take this further we're now going to get into our veins okay so our veins and their functions well they carry deoxygenated blood James there's an exception right yeah their pulmonary vein carries oxygenated but apart from that that's what they do furthermore they deal with low pressure blood Okay, blood which is way after the heart and it's gone round our system and it's trying to get back and those valves as we've said already they prevent backflow so beautiful we've got our functional characteristics there and then if we now go into our capillaries let me just change color go for a much darker one our capillaries here our capillaries what are we talking about here well they are there for efficient gauge exchange i mean they are designed for diffusion not least because those red blood cells squeeze down them very very tightly and they're important for the removal of waste so i just want to quickly come back to that point the fact you can literally see now this short diffusion path of let's say oxygen into so uh, into the muscle tissue or let's say from the blood it's co2 going into the alveolus 
you know what we've got here is a very short diffusion path of any gases that are being carried uh, on this red blood cell itself hence that scale being relevant okay so there we go let's uh, do another section before a break here we've got aerobic and anaerobic exercise now there's a few things i actually want to mention on this particular topic but i'm, I'm going to try and focus it so first of all guys again i want to just link it into your other studies what we have got on this side are reactants now i know all you PE teachers, GCSE, we say, James, we don't use that term. I know, but they do in their GCSE biology, so I'm making sure that they understand it in context of our subject, okay? So just to be clear, when we're talking about aerobic respiration, which of course is energy release in the presence of sufficient oxygen, we have two reactants. We have our glucose, which is our fuel, and we have our oxidizing, obviously, oxygen. So we need those two reactants. Over on this side, to an extent, we have the products of that reaction, and our products are carbon dioxide, and water but we also have the release of energy through that process so a couple of things here that energy can go off to perform numerous processes such as being transferred to the kinetic energy source and producing movement okay i'm not going to get into energy transfer you guys know it from your physics but that's the same process that's happening here okay we're also saying the type of energy that this is releasing okay what we're finding with this is this is what we would call short uh, let me get the right way around this is what we would call long duration or sustainable and we can call it low intensity energy so this sort of can keep going and is sustainable but this energy can only power sort of more moderate intensity things so what are we talking about here we're talking about our marathon we're talking about our triathlete think about kate from the start we're talking about the whole tennis match for tom we are not talking about particularly a gymnastics routine which is far more anaerobic more of which in a second in fact more of which now anaerobic respiration here's our reactants glucose here's our product lactic acid remember that this is a fatiguing byproduct but also lactate which is part of this lactic acid can be reused anyway we won't go into that but again we get this release of energy that energy can be used for movement what kind of movement james i hear you say well this time we get short duration and we get high intensity energy and the thing maybe to really realize uh, my writing the thing to realize here as particularly relevant is that these two systems are operating simultaneously at all times including when you're sat there doing the session it's just which one's sort of dominant and releasing more energy and of course as we're doing low intensity stuff it's aerobic when we're doing high intensity stuff it's anaerobic right they they sort of they have a threshold against one another but this is just one sort of notion I want to get. I'll only do this for um, the aerobic system, but I want to redraw the image in a slightly different way, and I encourage you to do this for the intuition, okay? So what we've got is if we put our reactants of aerobic respiration, let's assume this is a marathon or an open water swim or something like that. So what we've got here is we've got our glucose. We've got sufficient oxygen. There's our reactants. And what we're saying is, and notice what I do here, folks, that goes to... That goes to H2O and CO2. And now you probably all thinking, James, you've missed something out here. You said, where's the energy? And why is that thing going downwards? Well, the point I want to make is that this combination here is a high energy state. And this is a low energy state. Why? Because over here, we have released all this energy. <sighs> I don't know what that was. And that energy is that which is going to go and be transferred to movement based energy so you know that as the kinetic the kinetic energy store of course so the point i want to make is this is high energy and then of course our, re our products are low energy and that causes the and that uh, evocative of the release of energy and that energy can be used for movement and then the other key thing folks is that you can differentiate long duration uh, low intensity exercise with short duration high intensity with short duration high intensity i should have said things like a javelin throw I should have said things like a smash in badminton tennis. Uh, I should have said things like a long jump. Um, I should have said something like um, um, uh, a big tackle in rugby. Millions of examples. Okay, let's move things on. I'm probably going to stop after section six here for a break. But section six, recovery. Now, a couple of warnings about this. First of all, you will be asked about specific... 
methods of recovery potentially so do see these in isolation folks because you could specifically get asked about ice baths or massage or diet or cool down but let's just run through this one way of recovering from vigorous look out for that word or description of that kind of exercise in your uh, question the question might say how would someone recover from a very very hard high intensity interval training session that's vigorous exercise right so they could do a cool down why it maintains elevated breathing rate so you know our breathing rate would sort of stay high for a period of time it's a bit false that even though aqa want me to tell you it breathing rate actually falls quite rapidly after exercise breathing depth that stays up for a longer anyway it doesn't matter maintains elevated heart rate we agree with that it's an opportunity for stretching and a removal of lactic acid through that movement and of course that movement all sort of flushes uh, the worked muscles with oxygenated blood and, and, and pulls out that lactic acid sippity mm. Nice. Manipulation of diet. Well, after exercise, we will rehydrate. Typically, water could be isotonic or uh, hypertonic drinks. We'll often take carbohydrates for energy. We could call this all kinds of things. So we can sort of glycogen compensate. There's all kind of terminology for this. But basically, we wanted to eat some kind of complex carbohydrates. And protein, and we probably want to add here, this is for repair, but perhaps more importantly, adaptation. So if we've trained really hard, we want protein for that adaptation process. Now, again, we're not going to get into your biology, but you lot know how that protein is doing that. You know it's been broken down. You know it's been delivered to the ribosomes as amino acids. Use that link. You don't need to write about it, but that, assum that assumption and understanding will help you here. Ice baths, they're really good for present preventing the delayed onset of muscle soreness. So get that in your answers. They help to flush capillaries. Why does this happen? Well, folks, when you get in an ice bath, I'm sure you do all the time, but when you get in an ice bath, what happens is that your blood is kind of sucked and redirected, redistributed into the core of your body to keep it away from your skin and your muscle tissue. Because that's where it's colder, right? And then once you get out of the ice, sometimes into warm water, you might have done that yourself, then of course that blood then flushes back through the muscles and flushes it through and it prevents pooling of blood. Now, massage, which is the manipulation of tissue um, through, usually through the hands, but it can be through things like, don't forget, things like foam rollers could be an example of this as well. Or what those little gun things, you know, the ones, I've got them in my gym, I go to never use them to embarrass and the flab goes everywhere. But anyway, what's this good for? It's very specific and localized. It prevents DOMS or it can help prevent DOMS. And it's a good removal of toxins. You could be talking here about your lactic acid. You could also be talking here about numerous and basically if blood is pulled in a particular area our muscles become tight that can be effective so again just want to say look out for these individually in questions now where are we going with this i think we're oh well now we'll do one of the sections section seven before we move on folks can we be reminded that aqa require you to know three different types of exercise uh, effects of exercise we have got one we have got two and we have got three now what i've decided to do is go right i'm going to focus on the short-term effects and I'm going to leave you guys to think about this one. I'm not going to go over this in detail. That's for you. It's all the information you need there. Start to think about what the impact of those long-term changes over months and years would be. You know, what would be the impact of building better CV endurance, for example? You can do uh, aerobic respiration at higher intensity of exercise. Therefore, you delay fatigue, etc. You know, go for the impact of those. But where I want to go is I want to focus on immediate effects of exercise and the short-term effects. So let's make sure we've got these. First of all, we get hot, sweaty red skin. Look, hot because we've got energy release and a byproduct, of, or you know, one of the outcomes of that is energy release, and therefore there's an increase in temperature. Sweating is a form of evaporation on the skin. It's actually a cooling mechanism, it's good for us. We get red skin. Why? Because blood is redistributed skin to help us cool down. We get an increase in frequency of breathing. Well, actually, first of all, this happens, and then this happens later. So can I just stress here, when we start exercising, the depth of our breathing will go up if we're doing any kind of exercise above resting levels. However, breathing frequency, how often we breathe, how quickly we breathe, that only really increases through heavy, high intensity exercise. You might wanna sort of look out for that next time you play sport. Depth first, frequency second or less. I'm not gonna get into the respiratory control center and how that works and the fact that uh, the fact that exhalation is, anyway, it doesn't matter, but just be aware of that. What about the short term, sort of a day and a half after exercise or up to a day and a half? What might we feel? Well, we might be knackered, innit? So, yeah, we might feel tired. I often feel more energized after exercise. You, I don't know. Lightheadedness, meh. Nausea, I mean, you'd have to work hard, but yeah, I suppose so. Ache, and this is the one that gets me. The old DOMS, when DOM comes to visit. Uh, delayed onset of muscle soreness. Sometimes I don't exercise regular enough, probably. And like, oh my God, sometimes the DOMS I get, I can't even stand up straight. Anyway aching doms cramp cramp is 
a lack of um, a lack of minerals, particularly sodium and calcium in the muscle, which are both important for uh, muscular contraction. So mineral, a lack of minerals, if we put down our minerals, can cause that. Okay, so there's our short-term effects of exercise. I'm going to take the shortest of breaks, and I'm going to be straight back with you with levers, everyone's favourite. So, my little cherubs, let's do the levers thing. Um, first of all, AQA, what do they want us to know? They, AQA claim <coughs> that there are three components to any lever. That's four. Anyway, they tell us they are the fulcrum. I agree, there it is. It's typically a joint in the human body. They are a load or resistance. This could be lots of things, but it's often a weight or an object or an implement we're carrying. It could be our own body weight as well. So let's just put a weight of in general sense. That's there as well, you know. Maybe a javelin we're holding or a football we're kicking or something. And we've got an effort. And here it is. We agree. This effort is always a muscle contraction. Okay? So that's always a muscle contraction. And if you really want to get technical, it's the insertion point of a muscle contraction. I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but it's where the muscle actually attaches to the bone. That's where the effort is. You physicists, you might want to get in the distance of the fulcrum and then you can talk about talks. Anyway, we're not going to get into that here. It's not relevant. We're revising. Now, I have said there are four components to a lever because the fourth one, we do need a lever arm. Without this sort of rigid bar, folks, there is no lever. So that typically is a long bone in the human body. Of course, there are exceptions, but that would be a long bone in the human body. Think femur, think tibia, think ulna. That's what those sort of rigid bars would be and of course it, the, the muscle needs something to pull against hence that point so that's the first thing secondly we're going to go into classification of levers okay and then we're going to look at what levers do so classification we're going to look at what we call our first class levers first obviously that makes sense first class and the key thing to be aware of with the first class is that the central component or the component that is between the other two will always be the fulcrum between Okay, so what we see, let's look at our neck extension example. Here's a neck extension example. Look, we've got the effort here. Oh, I'll do a different color. We've got the effort here of the neck muscles pulling down on the back of the head. Well, I'm not going to get into those scalene, the cloud muscle, doesn't matter. But what we've got sort of at the front of the head is actually the weight of the head. You know, the, the, the center of mass of the head acts down almost sort of, it's actually towards the face. But the fulcrum, which is actually the neck joint, the atlas and axis joint there, is between the other two. So the fulcrum is between the other two, so therefore it's a first class lever. Now people often get a bit confused with elbow extension, and can I tell you categorically, with no exceptions whatsoever, that elbow extension, assuming that it's what we call a concentric contraction, okay, so the muscle is shortening, is always a contraction of the tricep brachii and is always a first class lever. That's if it's concentric. I'm not going to get into eccentric levers. I've got a blog on it if you're interested. Now, what are we saying here? Well, the load is kind of like the racket and the forearm. The fulcrum is the elbow joint, but the effort, this bit here, this is the tricep muscle on the back of the upper arm, actually. And there's, look, look where it's attached, right there, folks. It's attached just there. So even though it's only slight, the fulcrum is between the other two points. Therefore, this makes it a first-class lever. So those are the two examples we want to look, uh, want you to look for here. Now, if we're looking at our second-class lever, and I've got to change my canvas after this one, our second-class levers are really simple because there's only one of them, and that is what we'd call plantar flexion at the ankle. Now, I never know sort of technical as go here. Technically, there is one other example, but we're only going to look at this one because we're only going to focus on concentric contractions. You teach us if you're interested, go and have a look. But this is the point we want to make. For a second class lever, the load is between. Okay, so the load is between the effort and the fulcrum. So notice what we've got here. We've got the weight of the body acting downwards. You know, that's the center of mass of the body, acting down, typically through the tibia. That's the center of mass where it comes down. We have got, we have got here, the effort, this is the gastrocnemia supplying force to the heel bone. It's got another name, the heel bone, I'll do it here. And that, of course, is pulling upwards in that direction. And then, of course, we've got our fulcrum here. And our fulcrum is the ball of the foot. Okay, ball of the foot with the floor. So that causes the sort of the toes to point down, the ankle to raise or the heel to raise. That, of course, is plantar flexion. And it's a second class lever. Why? Because our load is between the other two components. So we need to look for that. Now, this one also operates with what we call mechanical advantage, more of which in a second. OK, folks, mechanical advantage, more of which in a second. Now, I'm going to change my canvas. I will be straight back to you. 
So let's finish off our lever stuff and we're obviously we're gonna look here at our third class lever now. So what do we find here? Of course, with our third class lever, we're gonna find our effort is between. Okay, so effort between, not necessarily in the middle of course, but between, so what do we find here? For our, for our uh, elbow flexion, think bicep curl, here we've got our bicep muscle, which is inserting actually down onto the radius just here. And that is between the, the fulcrum of the uh, elbow joint itself and of course the, the weight of the dumbbell. So therefore it's a third class lever. Why? Because the effort is between. If we look at something like knee flexion, we get the same thing. The hamstrings are the effort that they're contracting to cause knee flexion. The fulcrum is the joint of the knee and the load is the actual weight of the leg. At this point, you see that plantar flex toe carrying that leg backwards and behind. Therefore, it's a third class lever. Why? Because the effort is between. So be prepared to recognize those things. Now, mechanical advantage is a topic which is very commonly misunderstood. I've, I've put the clear definition in here for you. The mechanical advantage is the effort, uh, effort arm divided by the load arm. So let's make sure we're clear what that is. The effort arm is the horizontal distance between the fulcrum, there's the our effort arm, I'll put it E A there, between the fulcrum and the effort, in which case this is the gastronomy is applying its force to the heel. Whereas our, I'll do this in sort of grey, our load arm here is the distance between the load and the fulcrum. So this is our LA, our load arm. So you see here, because we've got a larger effort arm, our effort arm is larger, our load arm is smaller, that leads to a mechanical advantage. Now, why is this relevant? The key thing I wanna get across to you is that these systems can overcome large loads with relatively little effort. Now, is it a surprise therefore, now guys, you can go and experiment with this if you want to, but is it any surprise therefore that we find this second class lever, which is where we get mechanical advantage, we find it in the weight bearing area of the heel? No, because that's where we carry our weight, that's where we carry our body weight and do that. Now, there are some negatives, down arrow, we tend to get a short range of motion, short ROM, okay? And we also tend to get low speed of movement. So even though these are, even though these are kind of strong levers, they do lots of force with not too much effort. Despite that, they're kind of limited because they can't move fast with lots of, lots of flexibility. And your other two types of levers, your first and your thirds, tend to not to operate well. I'm not going to get into it. They tend not to operate with mechanical advantage. They approach something called mechanical disc, if it doesn't matter. But the point I want to make here is that those are more flexible and more rapid, pacier. So therefore, it's kind of useful for us to think about that. Okay, let's move things on. Planes and axes, which, by the way, will always be asked in unison, together. Okay, so let's first of all approach planes and axes, and then we'll go through them together. So first of all, planes. We need to know that this is our sagittal plane. We need to know that this is our frontal plane. And we need to, what am I saying need to know over and over again? And we need to know that this is our transverse plane. Now, one of the key things I wanna to mention to you about, about planes is that is that limbs and the body move along planes. We move along planes. So for example, let's imagine this person here does some kind of abduction of the shoulder here, here, here. Can you see how that's moving effectively along this plane that way. That's what a plane is. So you can start to think about the types of movement. Now, one thing with transverse, this is rotational exercises, you know, like turning, going from, you know, pivoting in netball, for example. It's rotational. Now, we'll come back to these. Now, just classic examples. Let's take our sagittal plane first. Look at this person. We've really worked on these images, so you can actually see them moving along the plane. But can you see, somersault in gymnastics is movement along the sagittal plane. A cartwheel is movement along the front, I can't see that coming, front of plane. And rotating in the circle only, not the actual release of the, um, or the movement of the arms, but this is what we would call movement along the transverse plane. All well and good, that's what our planes do for us. But of course, we also need to understand our axes, okay? So one by one, let's go through these. Our first axis here, this is what we refer to as our longitudinal, sometimes called the vertical axis. There it is, from top to bottom, pass through the body. Now, can I remind you that the reason this is relevant is that if we were to rotate this bar, which is stuck through like a kind of some kind of 
Anyway, let's not go down that road. That would turn this whole performer around in like a 180, a 360, right? That's what, so that axis is rotation around the axis. Secondly, what we've got here is we have got our... Um, we've got here our transverse... By the way, the reason I pause there is I'm doing five GC revision sessions this week and all five exam boards call them different things, absolutely ridiculous. So I'm just making sure I'm on the right track to don't screw up and talk to you about WJC axes, for example. Anyway, so that's our transverse axis. And again, notice rotation around this axis in either direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, that's gonna cause almost like a football player, this person to rotate, think somersault, think forward roll, think uh, seat jump, that's a transverse axis. And then finally, folks, we have got here what we refer to as the, as the sagittal axis, the sagittal axis which is a bit annoying because it sort of shares a name but what's happening here is that if this rotates in this direction here of course that person is going to move in like a cartwheel type space right so what we want you guys to do is realize that for these movements let's talk about our somersault here we have we we are talking about movement along along sagittal plane and notice the language around around the transverse axis. Okay, so that's what we need you to be able to do. Secondly, here we have got rotating in the circle. So this is along the transverse plane. Um, if I come out of this without confusing myself, it would be a miracle. So I don't know how you guys feel about it. Um, and this is around the longitudinal axis. You know, think about something like also a skier turning a gate into like a slalom. It's a good, um, it's a good example, isn't it? And then think about this last one. We've got a cartwheel. We are talking here about movement along, along the frontal plane, and we're talking about movement around <laughs> the sagittal axis now i think i've come out of that accurately so i'm going to sort of <laughs> run away quick because i'm actually quite concerned that i've got something the wrong way around honestly teaching five different exam boards is tough on axis planes fine they're all the same but my goodness me it's so easy to use one and the other and obviously you students it's not relevant for you but you know for me it is flipping heck now then folks if you listen to nothing else from me whatsoever please listen to this because whilst i can't ever guarantee one of these topics is going to be marks in your exam i mean this one by all definitions is absolutely critical in fact just let me pause a second i'm going to i haven't got an image i'm just going to put an image on the screen for you. just let me pause a second So excuse me for covering up one of our mock exam questions here, but I just wanted to show you this image. Why? Because what we've got here is that components of fitness have, occup have occupied every have occupied every uh, exam paper that we've had so far, 2018, 2022. Notice substantial marks every single time. But the other thing I want you to notice here, folks, is how important the skill of justifying is. As an AO3 skill over here, look, this justifying skill is super, super important, okay, folks? So that's why we're gonna work on this. Now, I can't tell you there's gonna be nine or 14 or seven or marks on your paper, but there's a pretty common theme here. Now, obviously, that first question I posed on the screen there was to define balance. I'm not gonna go over this because I've got all the resources below, but notice the second question we asked you for in, in the mock for four marks was to take something like balance and justify why it's important to a handball player. And this becomes what we call an AO3 question, going back to that point I made before. It's a skill-based question, and you guys need to be able to be confident in how to do it. So how are we gonna address this? First of all, I'm just giving you the definitions. Let me change color. I'm just giving you the definitions. Folks, I'm not gonna stand here and read them out for you. Go learn them, for goodness sake. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take each of those definitions and you're gonna say, right, choose a performer from our six original, whether it's Laura, Josh, Julie, Tom, Kate, use others if you want to, and say, right, why does agility apply to this? And I want impact on the performance. So for example, we've got here agility, change direction quickly whilst maintaining control. For Julie, our netball player, ability to dodge an opponent in netball to get free and receive a pass. It has an impact. She got free, she received the pass. Maybe she passes it on into the D and they go and score. That kind of go and score a goal, that sort of thing. If I was to go right agility now for, let me go for uh, Josh, who's our 100 meter sprinter, it's really hard, isn't it? Because he runs in a straight line. So you would say, this is important, or you say this applies to him uh, during 
sprint start to change quickly without losses or balance or control to get into the upright standing position. I'm not going to go on. You can start to put those into your own language and trend words. Folks, I know you might think it's boring. Go through all of them. I get, I've given you a couple to get started. And can you please focus on the impact of that example? Now, if you want more information on that, students and teachers, I have blogged repeatedly about what I call the EIO model example impact outcome in my blog. So go and have a look at it. It's there. Where I want to spend a little bit more time is here. Once we've got our examples working on components of fitness, I want you as students to be able to go through this question repeatedly with almost any combination. Say, right, what if I had to justify the importance of, let's say I go for muscular, let's say I go for muscular endurance to uh, to a javelin thrower, okay? Or use obviously the examples we've given, those six characters we've given you. Right, the point is I have to now go through and make sure I'm showing the AO3 justification skills. So let's have a look at it. I've got one here, which is justifying maximal strength for uh, Josh, okay? So in this situation here, what do we do? Notice there is no definition in my answer. Maximal strength causes large amount of force to be applied to the block, okay? No impact yet. To cause an explosive start, guys, this is impact. It also allows the sprinter to apply more force to the ground when striding, which propels the sprinter forward faster. Finally, maximal strength in the arms and shoulders allows the sprinter to pump their arms, causing greater forward motion. In other words, they run at a faster time or a shorter time. Now, folks, what I want you to do is go through that process again and again and again. Always ensure, always ensuring you're focusing on that impact on the performance please okay that's what we want from you so folks i know i'm kind of rushing up but in some ways like you've got to go and do that yourself i i, I can sit here and write them all out for you but it's got to be the thing that's through and teachers who are part of this session as well i honestly can't think of better uses of final revision sessions and final time to go through those two tables and you support the students in making world-class examples and uh, applications through the justifying skill also this tends to come up as well in our extended writing and i'll come back to that in a second Okay, let's move things on. Um, I'll, I'll just draw attention to this. Notice that in justified questions, there are typically no marks for definitions. So I'll often ask you to define something and then go on to justify it anyway. You get the idea. Now, fitness testing, I'm gonna sort of leave you hanging with this one a little bit because the point I wanna make about fitness testing is a skill-based question. One of the things I really want you to get good at, folks, is taking your fitness test and yes, absolutely learning your protocols, which are all there. But once you've done that, folks, bear with me a second. I know this looks a bit funny, but I'm just gonna add a layer then get rid of my layers. But once you've done that here, once you know how that works, what I really want you to focus on is the evaluation skill. Okay, now when we are evaluating something, we are talking about its positives, we are talking about its negatives, and look what I've provided for you here. Let's go through an example, Illinois Agility Test. One of the strengths is really good for running-based games. So if you're a footballer, a rugby player, this is going to be really relevant to you. It also occupies a really small area. It's going to be done indoors, for example. It's quite practical. Okay. However, it's a maximal test, which has motivation issues. It can lead to coordination issues. How many of us have got from our prone position lying on the ground, legged it up there and gone round here, you know? Anyway, that's a bit extreme, but you know what I mean? We get the wrong route and therefore it can lead to times being sort of skewed. There's little sideways movement, so it's less relevant. Think about a table tennis player. How relevant is this for a table tennis player? Okay, does that mean anything to them running in that way? Not really, they're side to side. They're crabbing it all day long, aren't they? Never said that in my life, but um, there you go. And finally, it's one participant at the time. So this practicality, again, is a bit of an issue because it takes time to get through, let's say, a whole class of GCSE kids doing this, say. But that's the sort of skill we want you to develop. Let's go down to another example for balance, our standing stalk test. Again, the protocol's there. Learn it, please, folks. Make sure you can say uh, that as soon as the, the, the foot leaves the inside of the knee or the heel is lowered, that's the end of the test, this sort of things. But notice, little equipment is positive, small areas positive however sometimes participants struggle just with a technique so that's you know an actual validity issue potential timing errors you know you've got someone with a stopwatch are they getting it right or wrong it's non-dynamic so it only relates to static balances is not that important is it for someone like a sprinter and one participant at a time therefore it slows it down so folks that evaluation stuff and i'm going to allow you to go through all of that stuff in your own time with regard to the evaluation of those other tests can i stress to you like what 
all I can do is give you that information and ask you please to really focus on it. And again, this is an area which is very commonly tested and again can very often come up in extended writing, which we'll come back to in a few moments time. Now I've got to change canvases here, just bear with me. I think I have anyway, yes I do. So folks, rather than taking you through every one of those fitness tests, which look, ultimately, you can do, you can do and support your teacher and what have you. I've given you all the information there, really comprehensive information, by the way. But what I wanted to draw out for you, if we just look at this, guys, notice again that fitness testing has appeared on every single um, paper um, between 2018 and 2022. So it's a reliable thing to really be good at, right? I mean, who knows? Maybe it won't be on, we don't know. But the point is, it's a really good investment of time. But the other point I want to make as well is just notice the evaluate and the discuss skill really contribute marks on AO3. And that is because you're going to give strengths and weaknesses or the relevance of those tests to different performers. And again, can I just stress to you, you should be thinking about validity when you're thinking about relevance. And does it measure what it says it measures? You should be talking about reliability. You know, are there issues with the protocol and will the scores be the same each time you do them? And you should be thinking about practicality. You know, what is this in terms of equipment, use of space? How technical is it? How challenging is it? What's the te technique like? You know, though those things will give you very, very good bases for evaluating or discussing, um, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of those fitness tests. So look, get on with it, innit? You know, like that's, that's the thing. Okay, so from... That onto extended writing. Now, what I want to do here is, first of all, can I just remind you folks what you're going to do in your papers. On paper one, you're going to do one times six mark extended writing, which is non-synoptic, and you're going to do one times nine mark, which is synoptic. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. So what I thought I would do, I mean, I've got to put the paper uh, two ones on here as well. I just thought I would give you what I thought was the most important thing. Have a look here. Have a look at your six markers on paper one. These are called the sample assessment materials, so you can sort of neglect them to a extent, but it, from 2018, we get evaluate, 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 and down here we get justify. Again, notice what we've got there, justifying components of fitness, exactly the skill I went with you. So one of the things we can draw out from our six marker is we really need to be able to justify, we really need to be able to evaluate. So those skills that we have just looked at are really relevant as well for our six marker. Now, if we now look at our nine marker, notice what we're getting here. Again, Sam's is evaluate, so that sort of non-real exam, the one they put out first is evaluate, but notice what we get now. Analyze, evaluate, analyze, discuss, analyze. So here, we really need to be good at the analyze skill as well, particularly for that nine marker. Now, folks, with that in mind, I thought it would be useful just to, just a little gimme here. Depending on the command term, this is the language you should be incorporating into the writing of your extended writing. So for example, and by the way, if you, I should stress, if you wanna start looking for themes in this in terms of content, feel free. Notice I mentioned before, like ice bath, just named as a recovery method all by itself is, is one uh, in there. Recovery methods in here as well for nine marker. We talked about components of fitness, talked about training methods. These are really common. So have a look at what's in there. Fitness tests, again, very common. But what I've given you here, folks, it's the language that you should be using to emphasize the skills you're performing. So notice this one, a great example. You're asked to evaluate something. You're asked to evaluate, um, you're asked to evaluate, I, don't, I can't think of a good example, uh, the relevance of a fitness test to a particular performer. You want to be saying the strength of that fitness test, the weakness, the advantage of it, disadvantage on the one hand, on the other hand, whereas saying you're saying one way, then the other, in contrast, the upside, the downside, you must be saying the strengths, the weakness, for or against, the positive and the negative. That's what evaluating is. If we're asked to justify, we're saying because the reason, I believe this because the evidence for this, the evidence against in support of this position on the one hand, on the other hand, therefore, in my opinion, I think that this is justifying language. Now, you've got to have the knowledge to go with it, of course, but that's on you and part of this session and your teacher, right? You've got to develop that. If we're talking about analyzing, analyzing is neither saying why or saying strengths and weaknesses. Analyzing is breaking apart a concept and then explaining each part. So we're saying firstly, secondly, lastly. So firstly, I'd like to address this part of the question. Secondly, I'd like to address this part. The reason for this, because as a result, this means through, by, therefore, etc. and then discuss. The problem with discuss is, as you see here, it depends on the exact nature of the question. You've got to be prepared to use all the other language and they'll give you some extra language in there as well because it's more sort of descriptive. So that is a mechanism I would highly recommend. Now, if you feel you need more in that, and teachers, please, please seriously consider this. 
Um, I'll just read this out to you. We urge all students and teachers to use the Evelyn 6 and 9 mark guidance documents when revised for the AQA Paper 1 and Paper 2 exams. Find the document here. So if you go to your uh, revision notes and you go to the electronic version, you can download. That is utterly free. I want nothing from it whatsoever. And it is a full and comprehensive guide to uh, writing 6 and 9 mark questions, including... Uh, how to write synoptic links in the nine markers. Can you all, can I also stress as well? You've got the model answers, which you can go and have a look. Now, one of the things I love about our model answers at AQA GCC is, yeah, the six and nine mark answers are good, and the model answers getting full marks, all that sort of stuff. But they're not silly, you know. Like they're achievable. They're they're, they're it's hard as an adult to write air quotes like a student, but it. We're tr we're not trying to overdo it, over egg it. So do have a look at those model answers as well. Okay, we're very near the end and you guys have been super patient. Thank you. Injury prevention, section 13. So how do we go about actually preventing injury? So first of all, obvious things, we're going to come back to this warm-up, okay? This has got all kinds of benefits, but let's link off from there. For example, we could be saying, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. We could be saying, for example, uh, something like increased temp of muscles makes them more pliable. We get fewer strains, Okay, try to apply this uh, as you go. Overtraining, of course, we've got this principle of training not to overtrain. So in other words, we are sort of applying uh, the principle of moderation or not doing too much here. So we're not going to get what you might refer to as chronic injuries. We're going to avoid chronic injuries like stress fractures or tendon strains, these sort of things. Appropriate clothing. Think about things like cooling. Think about, uh, you know, like wicking garments. Think about things like AstroTurf shoes for, let's say, hockey. Give examples as you go. T taping and bracing, really good examples here. Developed on the A-level course, interestingly. So this one is to about support joints, okay? Support joints. It can be for muscle tissue as well. Um, maintain hydration <coughs> to prevent dehydration, to maintain concentration, to prevent mistakes, etc. Et no overstretching or bouncing. So we're saying avoid ballistic stretching to some degree. Operate with the correct technique. Think about lifting technique and weight training, for example. I don't know, how do I say this without being sexist? I'll, I'll just be sexist, shall I? You boys, you don't need to lift massive heavy weights in the gym. Just lift it correctly. Lift it continuously. And then we've got appropriate rest and recovery. Okay, we're talking about here the principle of reversibility. So, of course, we're not saying you should take too much rest, like three weeks between the sessions, but you do need rest and recovery because that's when adaptations occur. So the body needs to adapt in that period of rest and recovery, so hence that point. Now, finally today, folks, warming up, cooling down. I am confident that you can give me the components of a warm-up. We've got, number one, a pulse raiser, often gentle jog. We've got stretching and mobility exercising. There's point two. We've got skill familiarization, uh, line running in rugby or a passing drill in football or a shooting practice in netball or a rally in tennis or you perform a handstand and some stretches in your gymnastics, etc. And we get things like mental preparation. So think about imagery. Think about rehearsal, mental rehearsal. Think about uh, thought stopping. Think about positive self-talk. These are all examples of the fourth mental preparation. So what are the benefits? Well, we just talked about one, one's injury prevention. Uh, the effect of temperature on the body is that, of course, it increases temperature. I've talked about muscle pliability. Uh, um, they can elongate, stretch through greater ranges of that damage. There we go. Greater ROM, range of movement increase. So we get up arrow, range of uh, motion. Gradual increase into, into effort and full pace. So one thing, by the way, is that you should have, depending on what you're doing, you should have some intensity in your warm-up. I mean, it often comes in the skill part, right, where we've done our pulse raise or our stretch, and we're now actually getting into sort of like some performance. Psychological preparation. Think about, for example, control arousal. Think about, uh, for example, concentration, selective attention. You could link it, of course, to your information processing. And practice of movement skills through the, wide, through the whole range. So we want to be doing really the whole technique within our warm-up. Okay, the whole technique, not necessarily the whole routine, not necessarily the whole performance, but the whole technique so that we're ready to go. And then guys, to finish off with, cool down. Three stages, according to AQA, stage one, apparently is <clears throat> to maintain respiratory and cardiac rates. Well, oh, I'll just go with it. You can't maintain respiratory. They go down when you stop exercising or when you slow exercise. Anyway, I think what they mean is respiratory depth. And cardiac rate. Okay, so they, they're held a bit higher. We gradually decrease them bit by bit. Respiratory rate goes down very quickly anyway. And we're able to stretch. So those are our 
one, two, three. So what's the benefits of this? Well, it allows the body to recover. Think about the sort of the injury prevention of this as well. Um, we've also got here the removal of uh, toxins and waste products, CO2, uh, lactic acid, and we've got the prevention or the reducing of DOMS. So DOMS is less likely to occur or last as long as it could do. But also, I like the idea of kind of unfocus, you know, to, to let go. I think a cool down is important for that. I think if I put it into it, you know, let go. How many times have you finished a sport performance sort of frustrated and by the end of the guy, oh, okay, you know, I'll let it go now. And I think that's a really important psychological process as well. So guys, 15 topics. I think I've gone way over my allotted time. If you stay for the whole thing, I mean, fair play to you. I feel a bit bad that I haven't gone through every single word and every single fitness test, but look, I honestly also believe that the notes quality you've got there plus the model answers plus the mark schemes are really robust preparation. I hope it's been valuable. Cheers. And folks, let me check we're back. Woo! That was a sweaty one. I've got sweaty ears. Never mind. Didn't you used to make your ears sweaty? What is that? Any, well, it's, it's sweating it's, there. Yeah. Um, Marta, any questions, yeah. any thoughts? I mean, it was a bit of a session. We haven't got too long, so we, have, we are back on at five with Edexcel. So we, any crucial comments, questions, thoughts, shout outs? Um, we've got a couple of comments, mm -hmm. which I'm going to raise first. Uh, first of all, uh, loving the notes. Absolutely loving the good, notes. They? We, we've had a, a can very... I, can I add a detail to that? Notes plus mock plus mark screen plus model answers plus infographic, in my opinion. So we've had a, a lovely compliment from Adifield. Mm -hmm. um, students loving the notes. And also some students, just a little reminder, um, some students, that uh, the comment was trying hard to keep up with Oh games. yeah, no question. Yeah. So just a little reminder that the session will be available on demand. Yeah. So if and anyone has been scribbling like crazy yeah. to try and keep up, it's, don't worry. Can I just dwell watching. on that point just for a second? It's always a trade-off for me. Do I sort of cut down on the content? And the, the, way I, the way I personally look at it is let me give as much as I can and give you guys flexibility in terms of how you approach it and how you access it. Do get back into those notes, and I think that's the best value I can give to you guys. So I am aware that it's that it's quick and it's probably not the pace of a lesson. If I was teaching those things, I mean, bear in mind, I think I just covered fifteen topics, fifteen lessons worth of material in an hour. So not bad. yeah, yeah. It's but do see it from the perspective it comes from, which we're trying to give you guys more than less. I actually feel bad that I'm not including everything that's on the market, basically. But anyway, you get the point. So a few shout outs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Castle School, Year 11, Mr. Spaces. Well, say that's, that's, Lloyd's, that's Lloyd's School, isn't it? Uh, yep, one thing, yeah. Little, little shout out. And also, out, Lloyd, uh, Shemai, he's watching. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and also loving the reminder for the students about today's session on Twitter. Good to remind the students that. Uh, oh, that was they first the, thing, the wasn't it? Today. Yeah, and then also Brooks Bank PE, also mm -hmm. this morning, 6 43 a.m. Wow. They tweeted for their students, please remember. Um, revision session today and I loved, loved, loved the tagline, you would be crazy to miss this. Brilliant. Which we, we can must use, that. use next week. You'd, be, cra next you'd be crazy to miss this. Crazy Hanging about with me this. for an hour. Come on. Absolutely loving it. Other shout outs, Whitburn PE, lovely pics of the lecture theatre with 30 year 11s working really hard. They've got a good the channel. They've got a good, um, they've got a good Twitter account on Whitburn. Yes. Yeah. Also, shout out to Anna Shepherd, who's at Alice Smith School in Malaysia. In Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, yeah. yes, wow. watching us. Eight wow. hours. Is it eight oh hours? My. Might be seven. Anyway. Oh my goodness! Wow, really, yeah. Anna, you should be significantly later than this year. year. So you. thank you, Anna. Unbelievable, Anna. It's been. It seems a long time ago. We were over there. You guys in Kuala Lumpur. Hopefully, we'll do it again soon. Thank you so much again. It was a brilliant few days. Appreciate that. Adifield that I mentioned before, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mellor student, wanted a little season, shout yeah. out, and also they would like a little well done for winning the cup. Well, Mr. Mellor's group and cover, I don't know if it's netball or football or hockey, I don't know, but congratulations, that's brilliant. And, well and, and again, Reese, good active person on, on online as well, we, we appreciate. Yeah, we've also got Erin, Sophie, Tash, and Izzy. I know these names. Their, uh, from Farnborough Hill doing their revision, so. Brilliant. Hello. Say hello to those, especially Erin. Uh, are, are those, uh, that was that shout out from a character called G, was it? It was a G, yes. the person. Now, Farnborough Hill, in case you're wondering why I know these people, it's literally, I get not. Quite, I can actually see their school fences just over there. So um, yeah, I know those guys quite well. Bless them. And for another local school, Farnham, local to us. 
Farnham Heath and Mr. Ryder. That's Andy's group, yeah, yes. Andy Ryder's group. Wow, that's down the road. Might go to, awesome might go past there to the gym tonight if we oh, can yeah. bother to go to the gym. Lucky. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so. Is that all of them? Sorry, Martin. Yes. Okay, anyway, um, look, thank you so I much. Missed. I don't think I've missed anyone. That's, but... that's so lovely. Um, we are going to shoot because we've got twelve minutes to turn this around for Excel when we get to do this all over again with slightly different content. Brilliant. I got to remember those planes, those axes for Ed Excel now. Anyway, so that's what we're going to do. Can I just make one last point to you? I cannot emphasize enough to both the students and the teachers how much I believe in that principle of practicing or indeed learning through the course skills via content. If you step back and look at what we did there for components of fitness, it was really developing the justify skill and we're using components of fitness to do that. If we look at the fitness testing, we're using the fitness testing to develop evaluation skills. So I can't emphasize enough that I think that is sharp and robust preparation. Hopefully that's gonna stand you in good stead. And by the way, those skills span other subjects, students. So if you've got to justify another subject, the skill's basically the same skill, you know, you're, you're developing those ideas. So I hope that's valuable. It's one thing I try and get across the teachers quite a bit. Oh, and I must do one final shout. I really wanna say thank you to Jackie Brooks at PE Active, who's been very uh, instrumental in help and support. We're, the revision, all the model, uh, all the exam papers in general, but especially on the AQA. Teachers, if you need a brilliant AQA support, she's fantastic. Jackie Brooks, PE Active. I think she's at PE underscore Active on Twitter if you want to get in touch with her. Brilliant colleague. Anything else, Marta? That's all. Okay, well, I'm going to play some outro music for probably about 20 seconds because we really do. We are on in a few minutes, so we're going to have to go here. Guys, thank you so much from my heart. Heart for uh, joining us. I genuinely appreciate it. I hope it's been valuable. And we'll see you after paper one for paper two. I don't remember the date of the paper two session. It's, it's after you do paper one. But come for that. Again, we're going to do with quite a lot of work and skills. Brilliant. Cheers, guys. Have a great afternoon. Let me put some music on.